Good evening, and welcome to this evening's worship. Before we begin, I trust that you all enjoyed your meal and that you're feeling energized to worship. You probably didn't think I was going to use that word. Uh, you feel energized to worship. I do want you to know we have deacons strategically placed throughout the, the sanctuary this evening. If you start to doze off, they've been instructed to give you a little tweak. And don't use that. Uh, don't use the excuse, oh, I'm just praying. That's not going to work. We know that one. It's been used before. Uh, I trust that you all are looking forward to this evening as much as I am as we uh, hear from the Lord from the Word as well as we install uh, Taylor tonight. We're just uh, really looking forward to all these things. This week, our usual activities are listed in your bulletin. I encourage you to, to take your bulletin home and make sure you're aware of all the different activities. We will have our usual Wednesday night activities. Remind, especially those who are visiting with us who are <clears throat> visiting the church, uh, to come on Wednesday night. You want to be here on Wednesday nights to get to know people. It's a great time of just casual uh, conversation and as well as time in the Word and prayer. So we encourage you to do that. I uh, want to remind you as well that this evening is the cutoff for the VBS. This is the last date to sign up uh, tonight. You can sign up online or in the narthex. Uh, make sure that will guarantee that you get a t-shirt. It also helps with our planning needs. Also, <clears throat> there is a training meeting on the 22nd of May at 5 o'clock in the choir room. We'll be giving you more information about that. There should you should have received an email to that effect, and so if you're not receiving emails about that, let us know, and we'll make sure that you get on that list. A reminder that tonight we are in, uh, going to have the installation of our new pastor, Taylor King. We have a commission from Calvary Presbytery who will be leading that and convening our uh, meeting following the preaching of the word. We'll have the, the preaching, we'll have the hymn, and then we'll ask you all to be seated as we go through uh, with the installation. Our brother, Wes Andrews, who will be here in just a moment, will be preaching for us tonight. And so we look forward to hearing from him. You were all introduced to him a little bit earlier. And so uh, we look forward to hearing from him as he preaches from the book of Numbers. Recently, an opinion of the Supreme Court was leaked prior to the arranged public presentation. <clears throat> In the aftermath, we have witnessed massive and emotional responses. It's amazing to see that the mere words of men can have such an impact on people. Now contrast with what we are about to hear. We will in a moment hear not the opinion of an earthly court, but the authoritative word of the sovereign of the universe, our creator, calling us to worship, thankfulness, instruction, and fellowship with him. His words are not opinions. They are eternally unchangeable and authoritatively true. They do not reflect man-made laws, but the perfect moral law anchored in his holiness. Our response to his word should not be suspicion or doubt, but reverential thanks and praise. His call invites us to truth, joy, love, and fellowship with him. Let us then prepare to worship him when he calls us to himself following the introit.
Lord calls us to worship this evening in Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Well, let's do so now, responding to the Lord's call by standing and singing Him or Psalm number 100B, All People That on Earth Do Well. standing as we reverence the word of God and as we now confess our faith together using that confession printed in your bulletin from the shorter catechism of questions 37 and 38. Brothers and sisters, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory and their bodies being still united to Christ What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the standing as we reverence God's word, the New Testament reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. Hear now the word of God. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call in the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold 
from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who though through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Please be seated. We're told in the book of Revelation that in heaven the streets will be made of pure gold. The foundations of 12 different precious stones and the 12 gates made of pearl, each one a single pearl. But I suspect that these will have little value to us other than pointing us to the one who created all of them. Our entrance into heaven will be an entrance into the very presence of God, whom we will worship for eternity. Now, if our future, if in our future we will have these untold riches, but they will be of little value to us in the light of God's presence, how should we now hold to our riches on this earth? Let us then give as those who are looking forward to our eternal inheritance, not the gold or silver of heaven, but to the Lord himself. Let us pray. We ask now, our Heavenly Father, that you be glorified and honored through the giving of your people to your eternal kingdom work. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Please join with me now as we go to the Lord in prayer. 
So even our Father, we come before you to sing to you and to stand ready to hear from your word. We shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We come before your presence with thanksgiving and shout joyfully to you with psalms. For you are the great God, the great King above all gods. In your hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are yours also. The sea is yours, for you made it. Your hands form the dry land. We worship and bow down. We kneel before our Lord and our Maker. For you are our God, and we are the people of your pasture, the sheep of your hand. Today, when we hear your voice, we pray that we would not harden our hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial or the wilderness. When our fathers tested you, they tried you, though they saw your work. For 40 years, you were grieved with that generation and said it is the people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. The covenant people of God have a checkered past. They have not always loved you like they should. And we, like them, have constructed our own idols, served ourselves, neglected your word, concerned ourselves with the temporal over the eternal. We are guilty of sins of omission and commission, not loving you as we ought, not loving our neighbors as you have commanded. We have broken your commands, commands given to protect us and to enrich us, to give us light and to bring joy. We confess these before you now. We ask your forgiveness. We ask it through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered himself for us, that we might find salvation from sin and salvation to righteousness, a righteousness that is not our own but comes from him. So we thank you for hearing our pleas. We thank you for revealing yourself to us and giving us ears to hear and hearts that you are now transforming by your word and spirit. We thank you for calling us, electing us, saving us, and causing us to persevere to the end. We thank you for this local body of the church and praise you for the mighty work you've done in the hearts of this people. We thank you for the ministry that takes place each day as the brothers and sisters here minister to one another in prayer and works and fellowship. We thank you that you have given each member a spiritual gift with which he or she can minister to others in the body so that we might be built up as a congregation and offer praises to you in mutual ministry to one another. We thank you for the hope of our calling, that though we may suffer for a short time here, we have the hope of eternity, that one day we will dwell with you forever. Our Lord and our Father, you have told us to come to you with our requests, and we are a needy people, in need of your comfort, grace, mercy, wisdom, power. We have members who are dealing with hard providences from your hand, and we ask that you give them a peace of mind that passes all understanding. For those who suffer physically, we pray for particular strength from your spirit, that they might not just endure, but that Christ would be manifest in them, that they would be a sweet aroma of your grace to their friends, family, doctors, and nurses. We pray for those who are carrying covenant children and those who desire to raise a covenant family. We pray that you minister to them and give them the joy of childbearing and child rearing. We pray for those who provide for the care of their parents and ask that you give them the patience and stamina needed for what is often a difficult task. We pray for the family members who are ill. We ask that you use our people to bring the gospel to them, and that through their testimony, many would come to a saving knowledge of Christ. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask, Father, that you would be particularly sweet to them in fellowship and grace, and that they would know you better. We pray, Father, for those opportunities to, to give them the gospel, and Father would even joy in seeing many come to faith in Christ. We pray for the spread of the gospel locally and abroad. We ask for gospel success in the submission of whole countries to the gospel of Christ. We pray for the downfall of those who rise up against you. We pray that you would thwart their schemes and undermine the rebellion. We pray, Father, tonight for our brother Taylor King as he is called to minister in this church. We pray for his family as they transition to a new place and meet new people a lot of weight on their shoulders as they make decisions and as they make this change. We pray, Father, that this would be a particularly sweet time for their family. We pray, Father, for your blessing through the rest of the service as we look forward to the time of the installation. We pray, our Father, for the sanctifying work of your spirit in the lives of your people here. We pray that you would now minister to us through the word and we would be encouraged in our walk of faith. We ask that you teach us through your word and transform our minds into the minds of Christ and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. As you please stand once again.
for the reading of the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through 13. Hear now the infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of God. Now there is no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, to gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's continue our worship by singing hymn number 429. 429, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. turn with me again and your Bibles will be in Numbers chapter 20. Pray with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we are in need of understanding and truth. So Holy Spirit, we look to you to teach us, 
to give us insight and to open our ears so we might hear the good news of the gospel in this passage. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my family is from Florence, South Carolina. Uh, My wife grew up here in Greenville, and my father comes from a pretty large family. Uh, So his great aunts, there are 13 kids. And the last two were twins. Uh, And they were called Gene and Joyce. Gene and Joyce, and they're neither are married. Uh, They still live together. And every summer, they would take the, the nieces and nephews and take them on this big summer trip. That was kind of their yearly big event. They would take the, the nieces and nephews out. So as growing up, they're identical twins. So it's hard to tell who's who. And so we just called them Gene Joyce. And we just hoped one of them would respond, and usually the right one did. But if you got them side by side, you could usually, as we grow, you could, you could see the differences. Um, and our passage this morning has a twin. Uh, in Exodus 17, there's a, a like, a similar passage uh, where the people of God are thirsting for water and God provides water from a rock. Now, critical scholars or some folks may just say, you know, that's just a, a rewriting of the same story. Um, but I think what you're missing, in, if, you, if you see it that way, is you're missing what God is doing. Uh, see, they, they come at two pivotal times in the life of the Israelites. Uh, so during the wilderness wanderings, lasted 40 years, one happens at the beginning and one happens at the end. And so these water from the rock episodes become these bookends uh, to the entire wilderness wandering uh, episode. And when you set them side by side, you see there's actually big, big differences between the two. See, Moses was around 80 years old at the first one and he was about 120 years old at the second. The first occurrence is really with the first generation, right? Those who would die off and not be able to go into the promised land. And the second, really, it's, it's coming at the point where they are about to go into uh, the promised land. You know, in the first one, God tells Moses to strike the rock. And in the second one, he tells them to speak to the rock before their eyes to bring out water for the people. And so these are, are, these are bookends uh, for the people of God. And and really, John Curd says it like this. It's as if God is testing this new generation to see what they have learned, and the answer, sadly, is not a whole lot. After 40 years, they've not learned a great deal. The test was to see if they had learned what they had learned and when they acknowledged God for who he is and what he is able to do. And I want to make the argument that the answer to the test of what they were to learn in the wilderness is this. It's that God alone is holy. That's what he was teaching them. One of the things. I think a primary thing. There's a lot of book endings and word playing going on in this text. If you look at the, the end in verse 13, it says, These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. So that's at the end of our passage. If you go and look in verse 1, at the beginning, it says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. That word Kadesh, that's the same consonants used in the word holy. And so they're in the place that is called holy, and God is going to show himself holy to them. And then let's look in the middle there, verse 12. What does God accuse Moses and Aaron of doing? Failing to uphold God as holy. And so, what's at stake, I think what the, the heart of this passage is the holiness of God. It's not that God's holiness can be stripped away from him or taken away from him. It has been intact long before the creation of the world. This basic idea of, of the word holy is separation. To be set apart, to say that God is holy means that he is separate from everything else. He is unique. He is one of a kind. He's in a class by himself. He is the creator, and we are his creatures. R.C. Sproul puts it this way. He says, when the Bible speaks about, the, about God's holiness, the primary thrust of those statements is to refer to God's transcendence, to his magnificence, to the sense in which God is higher and superior to anything there is in the creaturely realm. Again, the simplest way to discuss this is to say that which is holy is that which is different. 
but the recognition, the honoring, the upholding of what we can only attribute to the almighty, omnipotent creator can be sinfully withheld from him. Failing to uphold God as holy is the issue here at Meribah. And the people of God, Moses and Aaron, failed to view God as set apart from all else. And that is the same issue I think we struggle with today. Each and every day, the church, its leadership, have the opportunity to uphold the holiness of God, and failing to do so, as we will see in our passage this evening, is something that God does not take lightly. Because God alone is holy, we should seek to uphold his holiness in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So the question I want to answer this evening is, how do we as followers of Christ uphold the holiness of God? How do we do it? In our text, we'll find two answers to that question. The first is that we trust in God's provision. We uphold God's holiness by trusting in his provision. The second, we uphold his holiness by believing in who he is or his person. So our first point, to uphold the holiness of God, we must trust in God's provision. Look again at verse 2. It says, now there was no water for the congregation. Now when it says there's no water for the congregation, this is no small inconvenience. This is a real problem. They aren't just slightly thirsty. They're out traveling in the desert. Numbers 26, there are, it says there are about 600,000 fighting age men that went into the promised land. So if you take the 600,000 fighting age men, which means anybody 20 and older, and you add to it the, everyone under, 19 and under, then you add to the women, and that didn't even count the Levitical priest tribe, and then you throw in all the cattle, then you throw in all the people who were traveling with them. We're, we're talking upwards of two, two and a half million people that are out of water. And so this is no small thing that has come upon them that the Lord has brought them into. So they're in the wilderness of Zen. It's a dry, rocky, desert region. And so this is a real issue. The people are thirsty. And they gather together against Moses. They are afraid. They're uncomfortable. They're exhausted. Their bodies are feeling it. And the temptation to complain is present. And it has made them whiny and irritable, we'll say. And how would they respond? How would they respond when they find out they're running low on water? Would they ask their Heavenly Father for water who has provided for them for so many years? Would they bring their request to the Creator of all things in expectation of his magnificent provision? Verse 2 goes on to say, They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses. And here's what they said. Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? So let's be very clear on what they're saying here. When they say, we wish we had died with our brothers when they died before the Lord, they're referencing... Uh, an, an insurrection when, when Korah led a rebellion against Moses. It was a coup to kind of take things over. And what God does is he responds by opening up the ground and swallowing them up. And then he sends a plague across the people that kills almost 15,000 people. And they're saying, man, it would just been better to die with them than have to experience this level of thirst. And so what they're saying is, oh, we wish we had died in the plague or gotten swallowed up by a hole in the ground and buried alive. Remember, this is, the, this is the second generation now. Majority of the first generation has died off at this point. Most of the first generation, or the, the, this generation, had never seen Egypt. Right? A lot of them had grown up. They were born in the desert wanderings, and they grew up. This is the new generation that spent their lives wandering the desert. And what had God been doing the whole time? What had God been doing while he was wandering, you know, leading them through the wilderness. He was teaching them about who he is and what he is able to do. He was driving home the point that he alone is holy. He was instructing them in a very physical way on just how holy and set apart he really is. You know they, you know they grew up. They had to have grown up 
hearing the stories of the decimation of the greatest world superpower at the hand of the true God during the Exodus. They knew that story. You know they knew that well. They were given and and probably even helped some of them build the tabernacle, this sacrificial system designed to display the holiness of God. They had a a cloud of smoke by day representing the, the presence of God, this pillar of fire by night, the Shekinah glory leading them and representing the presence of God in their midst. And when God's holy presence moved, they moved to wherever he led them. He fed them daily with manna in the morning. Listen how Deuteronomy describes this time in the wilderness. It says, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let, your hunger, let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he, was, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Verse goes on. Verse four says, "Your clothing did not wear out. You and your foot, did, your feet did not swell during those forty years. So that miraculously, their clothes did not wear out. Think wandering in a desert, your feet at least would get some blisters, but miraculously, the Lord protected even their feet. And now that they are in great need of water, they grumble and they complain." They despised God's provision. It's a what have you done for me lately kind of attitude. Look, we know you've done all this for us, but we're thirsty right now. What are you going to do for us? Their only concern is with the present hardship. Never mind all that God had done for them in the past. They had lost sight of God's great moments of mighty provision, and they were, they were grumbling. They were complaining. They were frustrated. They despised the leaders God had placed over them. They even despised the place they were living, this wilderness, this evil place, they called it. But what would it look like if they had wholeheartedly trusted in God's provision? What would it have looked like in that moment to just believe in God, to believe and trust? The question is, what would it look like for you and I to walk through our current struggles in life with full confidence that our God, who is holy, who is set apart, is in full control? How would that, what would that look like in your parenting? Parenting's hard. Sometimes we feel way over our heads in it. We're all outnumbered. (laughs) And what would it look like to trust in God's mighty provision? Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's a relationship at work. Maybe it's just, it literally might be the daily need of food and water. If need be, he can provide water from a rock. See, the lack of water was their opportunity to look to him and to watch in anticipation of how he would provide. And maybe the Lord has placed you in a similar position. Maybe you're in over your head and all he wants you to do is trust in his provision, to uphold him as holy and to look to him. See, I think the most striking thing about this passage is not the grumbling and complaining. To me, the most striking thing about this passage is God's grace in the midst of it. The faithfulness of a God to an unfaithful people, the absolute long-suffering and patience of the Lord. That's what's front and center here. You kind of expect him to wipe them out. (laughs) Are you kind of just, I mean, they would, you would see, they would probably, they would deserve that. But listen to what he says. Moses and Aaron went. From the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, they go before the tabernacle and they fall on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses and he says, take the staff. And we think this staff is Aaron's staff. Later it says the staff from before the Lord. So we think this is Aaron's staff. So whenever Aaron's staff comes out, you know something big is about to happen. So go grab the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your, your, Aaron, your brother. And here's what he says. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Simply speak to it this time. I want them to see firsthand my provision so they will never doubt it again. He's constantly teaching. He's constantly driving home the point that I am holy. I am set apart. My provision is great. He says, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. He wasn't just concerned about them, uh, but their cattle as well. 
See, part of what sets God apart from all others is his unmatched grace. His holiness is over and over and over met with rebellion and complaining, and yet out of his great love for his people, he graciously cares for them. See, God is revealing more of who he is through his provision. Again, R.C. Sproul says, What God does is always consistent with who God is. He always acts according to his holy character. So as we begin to trust in his provision, we uphold his holiness in the way we respond in the moments of great need. And God reveals his character, and as we learn, we grow in our belief of who he is. Which brings us to point two. To uphold the holiness of God, we must believe in who he is. See, verse 10 it says, then Moses and Aaron, they gathered the assembly together before the rock. And here's what Moses says. Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Now, after all that talk about God's grace and provision, is that the tone? <laughs> is that the tone that Moses brings? See, they, they, he's right. Technically, he's right. They are rebels. The irony is, is in that moment, he's rebelling as he's calling them rebels. And he seems to be adding to his own, his own frustration into this mix. He's speaking for himself rather than being the mouthpiece of God. He says, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Now you could take we as Aaron and Moses we, or you could take it as Moses and God we, but either way, he is not placing God at the, at the center point as the provider for the people. One commentator just put it this way. He, he Moses, overimagined his partnership with God. <laughs> it's a good way to put that. See, it's, it's what he said. Psalm 106 describes the same event. In verse 32 through 33, it describes it this way. It says, they angered him at the waters of Meribah, him being Moses. They angered Moses at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter... And he spoke rashly with his lips. He spoke rashly with his lips. So it's as much about what he said here as as much as what he, he does here. Because what he does is something very different than what God said to do. The Moses, then Moses does something he was not instructed to do. He was told to tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. But instead he strikes the rock twice out of anger. Verse 11, and Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. So it worked. <laughs> In one sense, the Lord provided. I can imagine that second, that first strike didn't go, you know, didn't work, so he strikes it again. But then listen how God describes the scene. He says, because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Because you not believe in me, to uphold me as holy. He's accusing him of two things here, not believing in him and failing to uphold him as holy. Ultimately, those are, those are one and the same. They're essentially one, the same thing. The lack of belief in who God is led him to the failure of not upholding God as holy. Holy. I think the temptation here is to think that's, that's kind of harsh. That's a bit harsh of a punishment for such a small thing, it seems like. And as I wrestled with this, and I remember reading this text years ago and just really feeling like, man, that is really, really harsh. And what I begin to understand about myself is how little I really think about sin. It revealed what I believe about sin and what sin ultimately is. And again, R.C. Sproul is very helpful here. I didn't mean to quote Sproul the whole time. It just fit. Um, he says this, Every sin is an act of cosmic treason. Every sin is an act of cosmic treason. A futile attempt to dethrone God in his sovereign authority. See, inwardly, Moses did not believe God, and outwardly, Moses did not demonstrate God's holiness to the people of Israel. And so we can pick on Moses here. Right? He's, he's, the, he's the good example in so many other places. Uh, but here, 
It's a failure to believe in God and uphold him as holy. Elsewhere, Paul describes a positive example here. He sets up Abraham as a positive example of this. In Romans 4, he says, He did not weaken in faith, he being Abraham, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So to put it briefly, Abraham believed in God. He believed his promises. He believed what he said he would do. And when we don't believe God, we are sinning. Ultimately, all sin is rooted in some unbelief. So when you find yourself trapped in a particular sin, I want you to ask yourself, what am I failing to believe about God? And as you do that, you will begin to dig closer to the root cause of your own disobedience. What are you failing to believe about God? It's hard to say what, exactly what Moses wasn't believing to be true of God in this moment. Maybe he didn't believe speaking to the rock was enough, and we need to do a little bit more. Maybe he didn't believe God's way of handling the situation was correct, and therefore he, he took it in a, in a very different direction. Or maybe he also doubted God's ability to provide for this many people. The reality is, as we look at the life of Moses, this is not the first time he's lashed out in anger. See, I think each of us have sin patterns. There's this indwelling sin or besetting sin uh, that is a pattern that we tend to fall back into when we allow the flesh to fight back. See, Moses' besetting sin, I think, was anger. Think way back, right, when Moses murdered the Egyptian out of Egypt. He took the, the stone tablets. He was so angry at the Israelites again that he threw the, stab, the tablets out of anger and broke them. And here he strikes the rock out of anger. I think this says something about our sanctification. God is always drawing out our sin so that it can be put to death. Even at 120 years old, the sinful patterns of the flesh rear its ugly head again. See, God is not satisfied until his people are holy as he is holy. He is always at work sanctifying his people, rooting out that which keeps us from believing his promises and relying fully upon him. Therefore, if we fail to uphold his, him as holy, to trust in his provision and to believe in who he is, he will remain faithful to his covenant. So when we are unfaithful, he will remain Faithful. I love in verse 13 the way it describes this. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. See, the graciousness of God is rooted in the essence of his holiness. What truly sets him apart is his unwavering faithfulness to his covenant. To a thirsty, grumbling, rebellious people, he responds by giving them abundant living water. This is water that came out abundantly and the congregation drank in their livestock. Millions of people provided for in that one moment. And I think this is true of the church. To a thirsty, grumbling, rebellious people, and despite our sin, God has provided us with living water. John 7 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who, who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, the pinnacle of God's holiness is the good news of the gospel. Through, the Christ, through Christ's death and resurrection and ascension, God has shown himself holy. That he alone is holy. And we, as his redeemed people, the church, its pastors, its elders, its deacons, and every member of the body that has been saved by grace through the blood of the Lamb, must uphold his holiness. As I was preparing and studying, I came across a book. I didn't read the book, but I love the title. So I'm not recommending the book. I don't even know if it's a good book or not, but I love this title. It's called Yawning at Tigers. Yawning at tigers, because I think this describes 
what we are doing with God's holiness. The title paints a picture of a tiger in a pen taken from the jungle, locked into a zoo, pathetically pacing back and forth in front of a lackadaisical crowd. And when the tiger is caged up, we can approach him without any fear, or we can come anytime we want, without any hesitation, and we can come on our own terms. I think this is how we often approach God in his holiness. But this is not the God of the Bible. If you were to come face to face with a tiger in the jungle, you would either run in fear or you would fall down on your face paralyzed in fear. And unless we uphold the holiness of God, we will never fully cherish just how amazing his grace really is. And if we could come face to face, it would look like Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that had been taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. That is the holiness of God and the grace of God coming together and the good news of the gospel. That is the God we worship, a holy God who gives grace to his people. Let's pray. Lord, you alone are holy. Nothing and no one can compare to you. Heavenly Father, will you help us? Help us to see you for who you are and believe in you and uphold you as holy so that the world may know of your power and of your grace. Encourage our hearts this week that we may trust in your provision and believe in who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and turn your hymnals. We'll be singing uh, number 405, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord.
Good evening. I'm Mel Duncan. I'm a ruling elder from Second Church and uh, the chairman of tonight's Presbytery Commission. I want to thank the Reverend Carl Robbins and the session of this church for the great privilege of hosting this worship service of Calvary Presbytery, which will conclude with the installation of your new associate pastor for youth ministry. We want to welcome Taylor's family and friends to this occasion, as well as special guests who are here uh, for this uh, installation service. Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church is a very special place in the kingdom of God, and God has richly blessed this people for many years. I want to thank you for your pastors and for your elders and their wisdom and their labors, your deacons too. Uh, I'm excited about God's call to Reverend Taylor King as he takes his place now in the life of your church. Let me also say a word of thanks to your session for the active role that they take place and play in our Presbytery and in the PCA. In the Presbyterian Church in America, written in our Book of Church Order, it states that the Bible teaches that there are two kinds of church offices, elders and deacons. The office of elder has two forms, teaching and ruling, both jointly responsible for the government and the spiritual oversight of the church, including the teaching ministry of the church. The Bible requires elders to watch over the flock. They are to be pastors and shepherds. An associate minister is a teaching elder in the PCA. He's a member of Presbytery and your session, and he plays a vital role a work in the role of leading within this congregation. At this time, it's my privilege to introduce to you to the members of the Calvary Presbytery Commission uh, who will be participating in the service tonight. Teaching elders Carl Robbins of Woodruff Road, teaching elder Chad Bailey, soon to be of the, of the Midway uh, Powder Springs, Georgia PCA Church, teaching elder Andrew Newman of Fellowship Church, ruling elders Derek Scott, and Frederick Marsanak of this church, and ruling elder Travis McConkie of Palmetto Hills. Others will make charges and ask vows to be received uh, to, the, to the man and to this uh, congregation. But let me add uh, briefly my exhortation. Dear Woodruff Road congregation, love this man, love his family, share your joys with them, and especially uh, your best home meals with them. Remember that ministry can be discouraging. Don't be obstreperous about small things. Help this man's ministry succeed because ultimately his call comes not from you, but from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good evening. I'm Ruling Elder Travis McConkie from Palmetto Hills here in Simpsonville. Uh, I have the privilege of asking Teaching Elder King the constitutional questions from the Book of Church Order. Uh, Taylor, if you'll come join me up here. These questions come from our PCA Book of Church Order 21-9, and there are three of them. Um, are you now willing to take charge of this congregation as their pastor, agreeable to your declaration in accepting its call? I am. Do you conscientiously believe and declare, as far as you know your own heart, that in taking upon you this charge, you are influenced by a sincere desire to promote the glory of God and the good of the church? I do. And finally, do you solemnly promise that by the assistance of the grace of God, you will endeavor faithfully to discharge all the duties of a pastor to this congregation and will be careful to maintain a deportment in all respects, becoming a minister of the gospel of Christ, agreeable to your ordination engagements? I do. Thank you.
There are questions for the congregation as well, and essentially these questions ask you to make vows of submission to Taylor King as your associate pastor and vows of support uh, for him as he enters into this office. So it's our privilege now as the congregation uh, to promise our submission to him as our associate pastor, as our minister, as our shepherd here among us. So please stand and answer the following questions. Do you, the people of this congregation, continue to profess your readiness to receive Taylor King, whom you have called to be your associate pastor, do you? Do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline, do you? We do. Do you promise to encourage him in his labors? and to assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification, do you? Do you engage to continue to him while he is your associate pastor, that competent worldly maintenance which you have promised, and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you, do you? Thank you. Please be seated. Taylor wanted to encourage you with these words from Ezekiel 3, verses 1 through 7, beginning verse 1. And he, and he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, Son of man, Go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them, for you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me, because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. So I just have three encouragements for you from this passage that I think are are in logical progression, but also they speak to us as ministers of the word and how we are to carry out our ministries. And so first, in carrying out your ministry, you must first be fed by the word. Ezekiel here is fed the scroll. He's fed the word in verse 2, and he's commanded also to eat it. He's commanded to feed his stomach and his body with what he's been given And then we're told also that after eating it, he found it as sweet as honey. It was good to him. And so God has given us his word to preach to his people, to teach his people. And so as men who preach and teach regularly, the temptation is always to think of the word in regards to what other people need. To think about what your congregation needs or what the youth need. Instead, we are first to be fed on the word ourselves because we are under shepherds. We need to be fed and built up in the word. So the point, sorry, rather to the point of not only being strengthened by it, but also we are to find it good for our souls as the prophet tasted it and it was like honey to him. We are to find the word good and be satisfied with it in our souls. And then secondly, we are commanded to speak God's word, not ours. Matthew Henry speaks about this passage in saying, how can we better speak God's mind than with his words? And so as we go to minister the word, we are to not speak our opinions or our thoughts, but we are to speak God's word. Verse 4 says, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. So you are called as an ambassador of God, representing him and speaking his word. And there's freedom in that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel or impress others with our abilities. We are simply to relay the gospel, relay the truth of the scriptures to sinners in need. And then finally commanded to preach and teach the word regardless of outcome. In verse 7, we're told that he was to go to Israel and they would, be, they would not be willing to listen. They are not willing to listen to me, God says. And then we see this in the New Testament as well. Paul tells Timothy to preach the word 
in season and out of season, out of season, regardless of the fruit that you perceive to come from the preaching of the word, you are continued to do so with patience. And so preach and teach the word regardless of outcome. So first, be fed with, your, with the word yourself. Secondly, speak God's word and not yours. And thirdly, do so without regard to outcome. Amen. I'm teaching elder Chad Bailey, uh, most recently from Second Presbyterian Church, uh, soon to be uh, Midway PCA in Powder Springs, Georgia. It's my privilege to give a, a charge uh, to the congregation this evening. Um, as much as it seems like this is all about uh, Taylor, it is about you as well as a congregation. As uh, was said uh, sometime earlier, you are uh, fellow workers uh, in Christ, and so it is something for you to hear as well. You've listened to uh, and, and answered questions that were asked of you, and those are, are questions that are uh, based upon and steeped in the scriptures that have uh, much to say about your part in all of this. Uh, and one of the things, it, it comes out of uh, Hebrews 13, uh, Paul, will also, Paul will speak about this in 1 Thessalonians 1, um, that uh, leaders are gifts from the Lord, uh, and there's a strong uh, comment about imitating their faith as a, a, a big point to be made. Paul will say that in numerous places. The author of Hebrews says it in uh, Hebrews 13, uh, 7, and, uh, and, and on in that chapter. Uh, to notice their faith, to watch the outcome of their way of life, and, and to imitate uh, their faith. Not mannerisms and uh, that sort of thing, but to imitate their faith as they follow Christ. Uh, and that's the way God has designed it and set it up uh, for you as a congregation. So I would encourage you to imitate the faith of Taylor as he, uh, to use the language of Paul, follow me as I follow Christ, he would say. Uh, and there's a real sense in your part of that as well. Paul exhorts that several times. And secondly, to receive his teaching. Uh, again, several times in Hebrews 13, also in 1, Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, is that same idea. There's a, there's a tendency, as the author of Hebrews says, to, to, to follow after diverse and false teachings, and we have to be on the lookout for that. So, the exhortation is certainly not to follow false teaching, but to follow biblical, faithful teaching from Taylor and to, and to actually receive it is the language in the, the vows that were uh, taken earlier, is to receive his teaching with meekness uh, is also the language of the Bible. Um, certainly to be, we are to be good Bereans and, and um, notice and, and study, but we're to, there's to be a receptiveness to the teaching of the Word of God. Um, that takes hard work, and uh, it's something that you're to be exhorted to from the Scriptures. But also, uh, thirdly, to follow his leadership. Um, verse 17 of Hebrews 13 says, simply obey your leaders and submit to them. That might be language that we don't like to hear and we don't use very often, but it's the language of the Bible of following, uh, following leadership, not into sin and not into ungodliness, but the way of Christ and, and following Taylor uh, as he is um, following Christ. And so to follow a, a godly man is an exhortation from Scripture and something we need to remember. As uh, we're told here, it is one who uh, is keeping watch over your soul. Uh, that's an important thing. And so you should follow his leadership as he follows Christ. And lastly, to support, uh, to support his work, to support his ministry, um, is also the language in those questions that were asked of you that you answered. Um, let them do this with joy, uh, the author of Hebrews says, and not with groaning. We heard that kind of idea in the, the sermon. Um, to do it not with grumbling and complaining and, uh, complaining and not with groaning at someone's leadership, but to let him do it with joy. And that's uh, an exhortation to you to support his ministry, his work, to do it cheerfully uh, and joyfully, and also to do it financially and to give and be generous, uh, but also to pray, as the author of Hebrews would say, quite uh, frankly and clearly, pray for us. Uh, several times you hear that uh, in, elsewhere in the epistles uh, to, to pray for your leaders. Taylor needs your 
prayers. That's no small thing. It's not a secondary thing. But to call out to God, this is spiritual warfare. And we live in a day and age where it's darkness and uh, evil times. And we need to pray. We have, a, we have a God, as we were reminded of, who is sovereign. And uh, you should pray for him regularly and for his family. He needs your prayers. Well, may God uh, bless you as a congregation as you labor together uh, for the gospel. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Holy God, we again come to you with words on our lips. Our Father, our Father, not just the Father of those brothers and sisters who dwell here at Woodruff Road, but together with the other churches of Calvary Presbytery. Lord, we thank you for your provision of this new minister of the gospel in our midst and the joy of having the brothers from Calvary Presbytery to be here to make it happen. Lord, you've ordained that, and for that we give you thanks. It's not often that we see the work of Presbytery in our midst, but we do give you praise, not only for the cooperation that we have with churches like Palmetto Hills and Second and Fellowship, um, but also the accountability that we have, that they would hold us accountable and we them, that they've helped us examine this minister, and that they've come tonight to encourage us as we install him as our associate pastor. And thank you that you've called teaching Elder King not just as a pastor in this church and an elder on our session, but to Calvary Presbytery. And we pray that he'll be a blessing there among the churches and other ministers in Calvary Presbytery as he takes us up the work of committees <clears throat> and as he goes to do in other churches what's being done for him tonight. But Lord, you have raised him up to be a pastor in this church. Thank you again that you've raised up a fourth faithful minister among us that has the same biblical and theological commitments, the same philosophy of ministry, the same joy to serve. Lord, we ask that in days to come you'll remind him that he's a, he's a presbyter, that he's not alone in his work, but that he serves with the plurality of teaching and ruling elders an army of deacons, a legion of Sunday school teachers and catechism teachers, a kitchen crew, vacation Bible school volunteers, scores of mothers and fathers teaching the same gospel to their children. Lord, he's not alone in the work of ministry and remind him of that every day. And we pray for this congregation, Lord, that as he serves them, they will serve him. Father, the Apostle Paul said that it's right for a minister to take along a believing wife, and by your grace, he, he, teaching Elder King, has one by his side. A faithful sister, sister of ours and a help meet to him. We pray for Julia as she does the work of a mother, as she dives in to become a member of a new church and to exercise her gifts. We pray for her as well, that she will be an encouragement to her husband and he to her and we to all of them. And for Taylor, Lord, we pray that when he seeks to obey Christ's command to cast the net in and pull it out, that we're all pulling on the same ropes that he is. Lord, we, <clears throat> we ask that you remind him that as a minister of the gospel, moreover than all of us, it's the Lord Jesus that he serves. And it's Jesus who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Give him this encouragement as he teaches, as he preaches, as he prays, as he administers the sacraments, as he disciples us and especially our children. And it's the same Jesus who builds this church in whose name we pray. Amen. Reverend King, I'd ask you to come forward and face the congregation that you now serve. Hear this pronouncement. I now pronounce and declare that teaching elder Taylor King has been regularly elected and installed associate pastor of this congregation, agreeable to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such he is entitled to all support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I now invite members of our Presbytery Installation Commission 
along with fathers and brothers who serve throughout the PCA, especially in Calvary Presbytery, or in any of our sister NAPARC denominations to come forward and to give him the right hand of service and fellowship as we welcome him into our midst. Before the service concludes with Reverend King giving us his first benediction as an installed minister within this congregation, let's take our Trinity Psalter hymnals back in hand, turning to hymn 417. Uh, let us proclaim boldly, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Rise and sing.
receive now this benediction to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.